So Anna um, Pollock is the founder of Conscious Travel and is like 45 years in the industry of tourism. And she has been working here as an independent consultant, strategist, change agent, and international speaker all over the world. And she's very respected by academics and tourism leaders around the world for her bold approach and thinking, her straight away thinking on that. And she has been working with Visit Flanders on the Travel to Tomorrow um, a project to helping to go from volume growth to destination flourishing. And so now, to, now in her presentation, she will actually tell us a little bit about all of that, um, the, region, uh, the, the where we actually will need to have to go, all of us in the world, if we want to have a good tourism industry and not only this, but also our, where we live and our visitors. So Anna, over to you now. And I'll share my screen. Very much. Yes, um, Noah okay. gave you the... Um, the Okay, is it, is, it should be, is it, is, we see you now. <clears throat> Do you see a PowerPoint? Yes. <clears throat> okay, super. Well, it's I'm really delighted to be having a chance to share these ideas with you. Um, I've been working, really looking at new models for tourism for the last 10 years. Um, I started Conscious Travel 10 years ago. Um, with the idea of helping people wake up and become aware of the need for change. And the last, say, three or four years, I've started to focus on this emerging potential of applying regenerative thinking to tourism. And frankly, it's a huge topic. And I think I have, I'm just about to um, put my stopwatch on so I don't uh, go over time too much. 15 minutes. Um, to compress you know, all of that learning. So I'm gonna go really fast. So uh, sit back, put your seat belts on. Um, but before I really get into it, I really ask you just to constantly, every morning, remind yourself of the context because the daily news, particularly here in the UK, is always about COVID and the economy, COVID and the economy, COVID and the economy. And yet behind COVID, we have these other enormous issues which are not getting the attention they deserve. I'm not going to dwell on this because people don't like to sound too negative. It's early in the morning, but we have to have an eye constantly on these issues. And I think in tourism, we have a responsibility as well to be raising them. So uh, I thought I'd try and give you an overview, a very quick overview of regeneration. And I'd start in a sense by telling you what it isn't. Um, I did actually want to ask you, uh, for your thoughts on what regeneration was. It would really help me to know. Um, but unfortunately, because of the time now, I'm just going to have to go straight into my version of it. Um, but it's far, far more than, as I say, accelerated or accentuated uh, sustainability, uh, a word that I really am not very keen on, to be frank. Um, but that's another topic. It's not just about making incremental improvements. Um, it is in fact changing the entire system. We're talking systems change now um, because in order to meet those big waves of change and impact that we have to face, climate change, biodiversity loss, particularly the degradation of nature, um, we're going to have to fundamentally turn our system upside down. Um, it's not about just doing more good. A lot of people say sustainability it's great, it's about doing less harm, losing, using fewer resources, producing fewer emissions, uh, etc. That's doing less harm, but it's not working because we're continuing to grow uh, an industry, a production consumption system, um, and we're not being able to reduce our impact fast enough to compensate for that. So then a lot of people say, and oh, now we have to start doing more good. And for many people, that's what regeneration is, is meaning. It's now we're putting things back into the community. We're improving the environment. And frankly, that's just unfortunately too simplistic. Um, but tourism is made up of marketeers and it's very easy to get the quick bylines. Um, and right now I'm a little worried because it is becoming a trendy buzzword 
conference organizers uh, are adding it onto their agenda, uh, almost as if they have to have it to be seen to be in tune with the times, but not necessarily understanding it. And finally, it's not a thing. What we do in tourism is we take an adjective and then we add it in front of tourism. So we have culinary tourism, we have wildlife tourism, we have responsible tourism, we have adventure tourism and so on and so on. And, and then we put it in a box and having put it in a box, then we can study it and analyze it in isolation. That's really unfortunate. The reason it's not a noun is that it actually regeneration is a verb. And if you look up different dictionary definitions of the verb to regenerate, what's exciting about it is that it ultimately is about giving new life and new energy to something that is potentially dying. And I would argue that the old economic and social systems that we've relied on over the last 350 years, the assumptions that that was based on, is also dying. It needs new life breathed into it. Another uh, definition is to realize potential. And this is super important because the regenerative thinking says every life form, this is not we're talking about machines now, we're talking about life forms. You as a person, the forest that's next door to you has enormous potential to grow as in evolve and thrive. And the purpose of regeneration is the same as the purpose of life itself. It's to create the fertile conditions for all life to thrive and flourish. My colleague and business partner, Michelle Holliday, whose work I strongly recommend you look at, um, says it's an informed intent and practice. We have lots of good intentions in tourism. They aren't necessarily always well informed, but we also then have to move from that intent to action to practice. It's based on a fundamentally new pattern of thinking. And this is really important because Albert Einstein said that you couldn't solve any of the major challenges that we have, those waves I started off showing you, unless we actually change the way we think. And Gregory Bateson, who was a famous ecologist in the 1940s, said the biggest problem we've got right now is human beings do not think the way nature thinks. And until we learn to think the way nature thinks, if you follow that as a general statement, if you um, know what that means, if we, if we behave the way nature behaves, according to the rules that nature has for us, we, we are going to not succeed. And actually, um, again, Lynn Margulis, a brilliant um, ecologist, we owe so much to her, um, said that life on earth is like a verb. It constantly maintains and repairs and outdoes itself. It's constantly growing and evolving. That's why re regeneration is so exciting because it's completely open-ended. And finally, if it's, if it's not coming across to you as radical, as in getting to the root of something and transformative, then it's not regenerative. So when we say regeneration is radical, um, some people shy away from the use of that term. What it really means that you've gone to the root of the problem. So if you look at the iceberg here, we've gone not to the trends and the symptoms, which most people focus on, but we've gone right down to what are the mental models, the beliefs and assumptions that are driving this behavior, these values. So that's the root. And then the concept of transformation is very, very different level of change. You can disturb a system, but you don't necessarily transform it. Let me go back a minute. So hence the metaphor you will see constantly in relation to regeneration of the caterpillar that transforms through a very interesting process into a butterfly. When it's a caterpillar, it's tied to climbing it, to literally clawing along and eating the leaf and the twig. When it's a butterfly, it can fly, it can go anywhere. It's a fundamentally different state of being. And I, I, I know we haven't got much time, 
But my concern right now in tourism is that we throw these words around like transformative tourism and then go on to describe what essentially are minor modifications to an existing system. And this is something I urge you when, when reading uh, <clears throat> these various articles and ideas that are out there in the marketplace right now and say and constantly question how radical really is this is it going to the root cause of the problem or is it just tinkering on the surface because the context that we're living in right now <clears throat> is this is probably you're working and you would even argue that you've been called to work a particular time in human history which is as big as the enlightenment it's it's one of those big paradigm phase changes that occurs in history rarely um, probably with increasing frequency but as big as that when we agricultural revolution when we when we stop moving as hunters and gatherers and became farmers or when we stopped being primarily farmers and started producing manufacturing um, and developing industry and we're right in that change between one old paradigm into another now this is why it is so radical and so transformative what is a paradigm well a paradigm is a bundle or collection if you like of values and assumptions and beliefs every one of you has um, there are things that you've been told uh, as a child that you must and must not do or that is right or that is wrong um, you've, you've collected this and internalized a set of beliefs about how the world works. For example, there are some people who are convinced that every human being is selfish and that the, there's a limit to what's out there and you have to compete for it. That's a set of values and assumptions that determines your behavior. Is it necessarily true? Well, um, science now is showing that human beings are naturally uh, not necessarily selfish and we're not always rational as uh, the economists would like to think we are so those that's what's happening at the root is our fundamental values assumptions and beliefs are changing so again it's a, a, an interesting period there's a role for each of us to play but forgive me if I go really quickly this is a, a diagram I'm working on right now <clears throat> which again is a variation of work done by Bill Reed, who's one of the founders of the regenerative thinking movement. Um, but essentially, it's suggesting that we're going from what is, is an extractive economy, where we see the earth as a resource and we take things out, uh, into a regenerative economy, where we now start to work with nature to help it thrive and blossom and flourish and evolve and so on. So this looks like a linear pattern, and in, in some respects it is. Uh, conventional business as usual was very extractive. Uh, that's how the Industrial Revolution started, digging up coal to drive steam engines, etc., etc. And then gradually we realized that that was doing some harm, and so we started to make it more green and more sustainable. Then we moved uh, towards recognizing that that wasn't enough. That's where we are at the moment, that perhaps we need to go one step further and start to actually restore the damage we've done. But regeneration is a leap, a leap over what, if you can imagine that this is a chasm, this is a hole. <laughs> um, this is where we make this huge shift in our thinking from not from seeing the earth as a machine, as a, bl a block, of a real estate floating around in space or spinning in space that we can extract things from to being what it really is which is an incredibly complex living living system gaia or planet earth is constantly regulating itself it's breathing and we are all within it we are systems within it and we're realizing slowly what the indigenous people have known for a long time that our role as evolved human beings is not to extract wealth, it's to take care of it. So um, 
I realize I've, uh, my, this is what happens. My, my iPhone goes back defaults and doesn't tell me what time it is. So I'm already up through my time. So it's a progression and I'll leave this one, I'll pass. So I'll get very quickly, the first thing you have to do if you want to become regenerative in your thinking, and that's what I'm saying it means, is you've got to change the way you see the world from being a machine to being alive. And again, this is a whole topic for a whole seminar. What does that actually mean? What are the assumptions that drive our current system? If we start to look at what a successful living system in nature is like, fortunately, thanks to all of the work in ecology and subjects like biomimicry, we now know that these are the characteristics of, you know, a forest or a healthy person, or, um, and we can start to design our systems um, on our understanding of what success looks like if you're a living system as opposed to a machine. Machines, we tend to design for productivity. So it's, it's the obvious thing is it's alive. And if you start to relate this to tourism, we know there are some places you go to and you just feel it's alive, it's buzzing, it's healthy. People are really out there engaged in life and so on. And other places which are possibly very deprived or very ugly and people are, are lacking energy, it's not alive. So again, because of time, I just wanted to, I, all I can do is whet your appetite, I think, today for more. The other key problem is a lot of people think that anyone proposing these ideas is talking about less. And I'm saying it's, it's not about less. It's about actually more of the things that matter. What regeneration does is it creates more health, more vitality more harmony, opportunity, and inclusivity when we work according to the way nature wants us to work and nature is designed to work. We can redefine growth, not just as getting bigger. None of us, all of us, every one of you in, in this Zoom are stopped growing in terms of size. And well, some of us are growing this way, but, um, but in terms of height, we're not continually getting taller and taller. But what we are doing is we're maturing, we're becoming more complex, um, more, more resilient, more productive, because we're also becoming ideally wiser. So in tourism, what this means is that we perhaps need to redefine what we consider to be success. And traditionally, we have said tourism is good because, because it produces GDP and it produces uh, jobs, et cetera, all of these measurable things. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a lot of negative consequences of focusing just on that. And what Donella is saying here is it, the outcomes will be determined by how you define your goal. And so regeneration is very much about changing the goal. I'm working right now with New Zealand, where they have a very um, enlightened government, in my opinion, that says that GDP is of no point whatsoever if it doesn't help individual citizens of New Zealand thrive as human beings. And they now have this four capital framework, they're calling it the living standards framework, whereby every ministry has to demonstrate that their, their policies and their actions are helping uh, increase the natural capital, increase human capital, social, financial capital. So, this is an interesting one that I'm posing and I'd love your feeling about it. I've been in tourism for 40 odd years and uh, the most frequent statements and questions um, I've heard over those years is how do we get people to recognize our importance? Um, how do we get to, to make sure that we can get the financial support um, from the government? Um, we can pay less taxes and have more freedom of movement. What you're actually asking for is what can this country do for us, for tourism? To me, that's a very immature question because as we grow older, we realize we're part of a bigger system and perhaps we should be asking this question, which is what can tourism do? Someone's phoning me from Switzerland. Is that someone from you? No, not Noah, okay. Um, 
What can tourism do to contribute to the health and well-being of the country and its citizens? How can we build a tourism that delivers demonstrable net benefit? And that's what we're looking at right now in New Zealand. So um, there's an awful lot more I could talk about um, with respect to how we do this, but in 50 minutes, there really isn't time to do that. Suffice to say, having uh, understood it's, it's a fundamental shift in thinking, we do have to then enter into a process of learning. Learning how to harness life's fundamental design principles or rules of operation. And so a lot of work that Michelle and I are doing right now is, is, is helping people go through that process of, of, of learning more from nature. There's a huge subject area of biomimicry um, that has been established about in, you know, 10 years ago um, that we can derive from. The second thing I'd leave with you is your importance, frankly, because regeneration can't happen globally. Um, it can only happen locally. The concepts can be global, but it isn't a question of just scaling everything up, which is the old model. It's about taking those fundamental design principles and applying them in the destination in its own specific way, because every destination is unique. Every person in that destination is unique. So whereas an awful lot of tourism has been designed either from the top down by big policymakers and or by big industry players, the future of tourism is going to be designed from the bottom up. Uh, so how do you change a system? How do you change a paradigm? Well, here's the good news. You don't waste your time trying to persuade people who aren't interested, they have to change. You actually start to experiment and work with like-minded people, just like you're doing with the, your group here. You work with active change major, makers just like us, and so it's up to us really. But the first thing we have to do is we have to have some vision of what this will look like. And again, a lot of people don't want to waste time with this. It's all the vision stuff. It's very, very important. The wayfinders of New Zealand will tell you, the, the, the people that voyaged across the Pacific will tell you, unless you can see the island you're going to in here, you won't get there. And we have to do the same. I'm having a real problem in New Zealand because people have not any practice visioning and we need to practice that. So. That's the ver as quick version as I can do, and I do apologize if I've gone over time. I just uh, um, wanted to give you the, the, the picture. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very, very much. And with this, I have so much to say to this, but I now um, I pass over to Guy. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Anna. I really uh, appreciate you spending the time to share your thoughts. Um, you know, it's it's something that you and me have talked a lot about, and um, yeah, we're we're going to launch in an IMEX our white paper about regenerative events that builds on a lot of the similar thinking, uh, and hopefully, as you and me we discussed, we can take that thinking and your thinking together and do something even even more fantastic in the future, which I'm really excited about. I guess um, you mentioned a little bit about Flanders and a little bit about New Zealand. What are other destinations that we should look to for inspiration at the moment? Who, who's doing a good job? Um, <laughs> who can we learn from? Well, um, that's a good question. I wish I could trot out. Um, well, first of all, in order to answer that question, one needs a fairly comprehensive understanding of what every destination is doing. And because I've been focusing on thinking, um, uh, I, I don't have that, if you like, internalized inventory. Um, I would say very few destinations right now are really actively engaged in looking at regeneration as a concept and as a methodology. It's very, very, very new. Um, I like the fact that you're we're focusing on the area in which you are highly specialized in, and that's how, how can we apply these concepts in the, in the, in the work that we do. Because if, if in that application you're successful, it will make it so much easier to to develop this concept further. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, th there's a lot going on from the bottom up in communities. Um, we can point to, re there's a, an organization that I'm working with called Regenerative uh, Travel, 
um, which are 35 resorts that um, have been un undertaken some understanding of what regeneration means. Um, there's a lot of work going on in Central um, uh, South America because the they have a very high population of indigenous people. And here's the beauty of this. So much of the design principles that inform or shape regenerative thinking match almost entirely the worldview of indigenous peoples around the world. It is not surprising. They have 20% of the world's land mass under some degree of uh, um, management or influence. Um, and that same 20% produces 80% of the world's biodiversity. What does that tell you? It works, all right? So I see wherever you can, if you can be linking with the indigenous wisdom, if it's current, or some of the older wisdom. I mean, like even in Europe, even in Switzerland, you have a tradition, right, of, of indigenous thinking. In the UK, we, we, we unfortunately destroyed a lot of that. Um, um, but that's a separate story. But the, the, um, the point is we don't have to start from scratch. And that's why it's called regeneration. It's a partnership now between people who have been guardians of that knowledge and ourselves who are, have the technology and the, the new modern scientific understanding. It isn't like we're going back. I'm not suggesting we all live, live um, in the forest. That's not going to work. It's going forward. So um, I, right now it's virgin territory, Guy. And I think that's not like, you know, we, we changed the, the name of, of our work to the GDS movement. And this whole movement is about us, is. the community starting to work together on this journey. Yeah. And, you know, it's just been in Switzerland with Olivia and with Laura and we're, we're really starting to think about regeneration and what that takes through. And I think that's the exciting work that we've got together yeah. to take yeah. this on a journey and, and to invent together. As you said, we can learn a lot from places, you know, Noah is from Findhorn. So we can learn a lot from places like Findhorn from indigenous communities. Oh, yeah. It's happening all over. It's just um, it's still new in tourism, to be yeah. honest. Any yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even exist the word yet so uh, i think that's an interesting thing so i think we could talk for about five weeks but we haven't got that time so um absolutely any, any questions um, anyone burning questions i'm i'm sorry we're out of time but Lydia had a question thank you so much for you sharing very uh, clear. And uh, one uh, curious uh, question of curiosity on the on the last slide. I didn't understand a word of the sentence. What is this enigmatic language you 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 wrote in the slide? I don't know. I think it was a Maori. Yeah. Ah, I'm sorry. It's a it's a slide that um, it's a quote um, from. Um, Let's let's see if I can show my screen again. Um, yeah, sorry, it's a technology. Um, here it is. It's it's a it's it's a it's Mari for and I, don't ask me to pronounce it. I will do do. <laughs> no, no um, but essentially, the the quote is that without vision, the people will be lost. And they have an amazing wayfinding tradition. That, as you well know, the Polynesians traverse the entire Pacific, third of the planet, with no instruments at all. Um, not just by the stars, but they had a very um, a spiritual relationship, in a sense, with, with, the, with Mother Earth. Um, but the, the point of that was that you have to be able to imagine or see where you want to go and what i was the point i was making olivier is we're not spending enough time and it goes back to your uh, well it was melissa who said we need to instill wonder and awe that's that's a beautiful and highly appropriate point i think you said olivier we need to make this more fun <laughs> all right um and Guy, you mentioned the word abundance i mean nature is abundant that if we can get rid of this idea that uh, it's scarce and we have to compete for it and hoard it. 
So what we've got to do is start to create visions in our communities of what it could become. Regeneration and uh, life is essentially not about being, it's about becoming. Um, and we've lost practice at that. I mean, if it's amazing, every time I do these presentations, people say, oh yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, how are we gonna do it? Tell me how. And I'm saying, well, that's your job. <laughs> You know, we have within us, each of us, the capacity to start to imagine, but we're just run out, run out of practice. So, um, yeah, that was the reason why you've got those funny words at the bottom. So thank you everyone very much for, for attending and listening and taking it to heart. And we'll continue on this journey and more discussion and doing and being around it. And so thank you very much, everyone. Wishing you a great day. Mm -hmm.